Today's uh, event is the annual Edward Said Memorial Lecture. And I just want to begin by saying uh, a word about Professor Edward Said. Um, I, I could not do justice to the contributions that he uh, made uh, both to the study of culture uh, and to the uh, question of Palestine. Uh, but I do remember very sharply the last time that I heard Professor Saeed speak, and that was in June of 2003, shortly before he passed away. And if you recall, that was uh, just after the United States had invaded Iraq. Uh, it was at the height of the Israeli repression of the Palestinian uprising, uh, and it was a time in which uh, we most needed the uh, guidance uh, and thoughtful wisdom of Professor Edward Said. And it was precisely at that moment that we lost that voice and that guidance. And so many of us, uh, and to this day, felt the very strong absence of that voice and that guidance. But it was shortly after his death in September of 2003 that I met his daughter, Najla Saeed. She was, at the time, uh, participating in a really fantastic performance of a pocket opera called Reorientalism, which worked to, through uh, new media and through performance and art, continue to dispel the stereotypes that many in the West had of the Muslim world. And so I was assured that even though we lost a giant in Palestinian scholarship uh, and literature, the message that he put forward was being carried on by a new generation. This is why I'm very happy to welcome uh, Najla Saeed here to speak today. And she has a new book out, which she will be telling us a lot about. Uh, that book is Looking for Palestine. Uh, of course, we have copies of that book here. And Najla will be happy to sign some uh, afterwards. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Najla Saeed, who is this year's Edward Said Memorial Lecturer. Hi. Um, thank you so much. It's an unbelievable honor to be here as a speaker in general, a lecturer, which is just beyond me, um, but also to be here um, as the Edward Said speaker. Um, my father meant a lot to me, obviously, as most parents do, but um, he was very important to me as a father, as well as who he was to everyone else. So um, thank you very, very much for inviting me here. Um, I have just published this book called Looking for Palestine. The subtitle is also very important because it's called Growing Up Confused in an Arab American Family. And that is the main um, thing that I, that propelled me to write this book, was my own confusion and um, fear and uh, apprehension about this, being the daughter of this famous Palestinian and not really feeling like I had any idea what that meant or who I was. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about what's in the book, just to give you a background on, on that. And then I'm going to read to you from it, because um, I feel like that's easier than um, explaining what I've already written. Um, and, and just to give you an idea of how my own identity as a Palestinian American has been, um, how, how I've formed it on my own in the past few years, which has been very difficult. Um, so my mother's from Lebanon, and my mom is, um, from a Christian family, but they, she, she, they're actually Quaker. So there's the first problem. And then <laughs> my dad was, as many of you know, uh, Palestinian, uh, but born with American citizenship, went to British schools, and um, he wrote a lot about his own identity issues. Um, and he left Palestine at a very young age. He was raised in Jerusalem, then Cairo, and then he came here at the age of, to the United States at the age of 14 or 15. Um, so, and he was also Christian, uh, Anglican, Episcopalian to be precise, um, and I was born and baptized as an Episcopalian. So there, again, is another 
strange thing. So then I was raised in New York City and I was sent to a private school for girls um, on the Upper East Side because my parents of course wanted me to get a wonderful good education and it was a very good school. However, when I went to school it seemed to be blonde and waspy. So, but I was Episcopalian. So you see, I sort of fit in. Um, but I didn't. And then my father, meanwhile, was in the other room writing Orientalism about representations of Arabs in the media and art and literature. And I was, as I say in the book, watching I Dream of Jeannie and trying to figure out why I didn't have blonde hair, magic powers, and a sexy outfit. So there was a lot, a lot of, this is sort of how I see myself to this day, as this kind of confused, lost child of immigrants. And yet, I'm also the daughter of this person who, uh, to many people, really stands, like really sim uh, symbolizes Palestinian identity or Palestinian American identity. So when I became um, a professional actress, and I won't, I'm not gonna get too much into this, but it became um, interesting to me to realize how much it mattered that my name was Najla Saeed and I didn't wanna change it. Um, I didn't want to change it because, I don't know, it just seemed, as I said last night I, in a book talk, I, I, I really, I honestly thought maybe if someone said a different name, I wouldn't answer them because I would forget that I changed my name or something. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, a, you know, everyone thinks I did all these things with a certain amount of integrity and thought, but I, I honestly just didn't want to change my name. It seemed like a very old-fashioned, silly thing to do in the world in which we live. So, um, but when I became a professional actress and I realized what having this name, Najla Saeed, which regardless of who my father was, um, how it meant I would be perceived um, and what would be expected of me, um, I began to really start to deal with my identity. So in the book I write a lot about how as a little girl, I went to school with these uh, white Episcopalian girls and I was Episcopalian and relatively white so I was trying to fit in but then I kept hearing that I was Arab and then I would sort of look at TV and see what was being presented to me as what an Arab should be which was Muslim and really brown skinned and, and a certain type of you know all the things my father wrote about either terrorists or you know fanatic Muslims or just belly dancers and and so I didn't fit into any of these categories so I was trying very very hard to fit in to America and to be like my friends, but it wasn't working. And then when I was in high school, I switched to another school where, where the, the students were mostly Jewish. And all of a sudden, I fit in. Um, and part of it was because of the way I look and the way I act, because I'm from the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which to many people um, is just a connotation of, Jew it's just Jewish. It's this idea that New Yorkers from a certain part of New York who talk a certain way and have a certain type of neuroses are Jewish people. So I think what happened to me was I had a lot of confusion about my identity. Um, and then as I got older, I started, you know, and the time in which I was born, I was born in 1974 and my mom's Lebanese, as I said. So we would go to Lebanon, but the war started when I was about a year old. So there was a war in Lebanon, and then my dad was Palestinian, and I didn't quite understand how that fit in, because sometimes he couldn't come with us. And then my parents were Arab, but we weren't Muslim. But we were, So there was a lot going on in my brain. So I thought for a long time that the best thing to do was just avoid it and try to be American, which I think is something that a lot of young um, children of immigrants try to do. Um, but then as I got older, I realized that I couldn't really avoid these things. Um, and I would have to find a way to deal with my identity. When I was 18 years old in 1992, um, my father found out he had leukemia the year before, and so we went on a family trip to Palestine. It was the first time I went and the last time I went. Um, I was 18 years old, and um, I think that when my father passed away in 2003, I wrote a journal entry about this trip because I had never really thought about it or made sense of it. But for some reason, I was missing my father, and I started writing this long journal entry, which ultimately evolved into a play called Palestine, which ultimately evolved into this book, Looking for Palestine. Um, and what I think that this trip did for me was a few things. It forced me to confront the, the, um, the 
all the different things about my identity that I wanted to avoid. It forced me to con confront Palestine as a place and as an idea and, and fi figure out where I fit in in that regard. Um, it forced me to deal with my father's mortality, my own mortality, um, but also it, I just felt very afraid because I was 18 years old and here was my dad telling me, I have just been diagnosed with leukemia. We're going to go back to Palestine. You're going to see it and then you're sort of going to grow up and deal with it and I'm going to go. So um, that was the launch point for the book but in, in the play. And so um, I realized in the process of writing this book that although I always constantly feel like I still am this like confused, I don't know if I'm American, I don't know if I'm Palestinian, I don't know if I'm Lebanese, I don't know if I'm smart, I don't know if I understand politics, that I've somehow still um, managed to internalize and really take in and, and understand everything that my father stood for and spoke about and um, was famous for and was, was revered for, which is a certain amount of integrity and an, and an association with my identity that it just, it just is. It, it is part of who I am and, and that is something that I will not deny even if I don't feel like I have a house in Palestine that I know each nook and cranny of the walls or like my grandmother was there, I don't have any of those tangible connections and I always thought that made me feel, um, that was what made me feel like I didn't belong there. But in, in writing this book and working through this process, I realized that I have actually taken in everything that my father taught me and taught all of us. And so in a certain way, the most common question I've been asked besides how does the daughter of Edward Said not know where she's from, which I think is not a fair question, but um, is what would your father say were he alive now? What would he be, you know, people constantly are writing, we wish Edward Said was here to comment. We wish he were here, we miss his voice. And what I've learned is he left us everything that we need to analyze and look at things the way that he did. and. My, my style of um, talking and writing and performing is very casual, very American, very, uh, I, you know, I come off as, as just a human being who's trying to figure it out. And I do that on purpose because um, it's important to me that I carry on something that he taught me, which is that as long as you're human and you present yourself as a human and it, uh, with all your faults and your your daily struggles and your wishes and your thoughts about what you like and what you would like to be and, and the you know freedom of movement you would like to have to, to sort of relate it specifically to Palestinians, people will listen to you. So, you know, many people talk about how he, he used to speak of this permission to narrate and tell your own story. And also um, this idea that we're all just human beings. And I think it's quite simple. And so Sadly, I went through this whole process of worrying about being the daughter of this person who seemed to represent so much and have these lofty ideas, but what has come out of it is this, this, incredible, this incredible realization that it's very, very simple. And we mustn't forget how simple it is. Um, you know, people have asked me, wasn't your father an anti-Semite? And I'm like, well, no, he was just Palestinian. And if you actually have read anything he wrote, you would see that he's in no way an anti-Semite. But people don't do that. People take their associations about your identity and your, and just being Palestinian or saying I'm Palestinian carries this whole thing with it. And so the best thing that we can do and that I can do and that I've learned to do is just to present myself as a human being. Um, and that's all there is to our moving forward um, in, in our, you know, in our quest for just peace and and you know in terms of what's happening in the Middle East right now with all the upheaval and all the trauma and the sadness my I think my father would would he would be very I, I remember when in 2011 when Mubarak was finally ousted I cried because I think that my father would have been so it was everything he ever worked for was for these, this moment of people coming together and rising up and realizing that they have power to change things. 
Um, but in the months that followed, people have been asking me, or the years that followed, people have been asking me, oh, what, what are we going to do? What are we gonna this is a necessary step. We're in a necessary place. The upheaval has to come. Um, the, the difficulty has to come. Unfortunately, there's a lot of violence and death and horrible things. But my father would never encourage anyone to give up hope. And I think that that's the most important thing. And so my book was just written to remind those of us of the next generation, whether we're Palestinian or not, um, that we have all of the tools we need to continue this struggle and to move forward. I'm just going to read a couple of little sections from the book, and then um, I will answer any questions that you have. Um, so in 1992, we went on this trip to Palestine. And at this point, I've just graduated from high school. And I, my, my father has been diagnosed with leukemia. And I am myself quite ill with an eating disorder, which um, had developed in part because of my own sort of disconnect with my culture and my identity. I, I just wanted to kind of disappear. Um, and there was a lot going on. But um, so we went on this trip, and I didn't want to go. Um, and we went to Palestine. We went to Jerusalem. We stayed in the American Colony Hotel, which at first really excited me because it was the American Colony Hotel. So I thought it would be American, and that would be good because I wasn't really excited about being in the Middle East. Um, and then uh, we went and we saw my father's home. And another thing which I pointed out last night was I was constantly um, – I was born in uh, – the states and I lived on the west side of Manhattan and all my friends lived on the east side and then so all I wanted to do was live on the east side and then my mother was from Beirut which was divided into east and west and we lived in the west but we were Christian so we were supposed to be in the east and my dad was from Jerusalem he was from west Jerusalem but we were Arabs so we were supposed to be in the east so that kept happening <laughs> I was supposed to be in the East all the time, and I was always in the West. <laughs> so um, I only realized that recently. It's fascinating, like, how much that played into these categories that we, these divisions that we create and how, how so completely arbitrary they are and, and how, like, I used to go to school in New York, and I would go to school on the East Side and be worried that if they would somehow, like, close off the, you know, there would be a war and they'd close off the west side and I wouldn't be allowed to go home. And so these are very real things that were, were very, very prevalent in my childhood, in my consciousness and my psyche. So this trip scared me a lot for, for a lot of reasons. Um, so I'm just going to read. So we went to uh, Jerusalem and then we went and visited my father's, the house in which he was born and grew up, which is in, as I said, West Jerusalem. And we, we found out that, um, my father wrote about this for the Observer, the London Observer, that um, although we were frightened, my brother and I were convinced that we were going to see the name of one of our Jewish friends on the house, like, door. We, we fortunately didn't, but we um, did encounter a sign that said the International Christian Embassy, which was a right-wing Zionist Christian organ. So, again, we're Christian, I don't know. All of these things started to s just spin around in my head, and I thought, I'm never going to make sense of any of this. Um, so, sorry, I just want to find. So this is, um, on the trip, okay? It was on this trip that I learned that my parents both grew up in Arab cities with Jewish quarters that were as much a part of the city as any other neighborhood. In the Beirut of my mother's youth, there was not only a Sunni Muslim area, a Shiite area, and a Christian area, there was also a Jewish area. Even now, after more than one Israeli invasion and countless internal religious battles, the synagogue still stands in Beirut. And as in any other big city, each quarter earned its particular designation because of the families who settled there and not because someone drew a line. My mom told me the story of how her famously philanthropic mother put money for the Jewish home in a blue box on the coffee table of a, Europe, of a Ger German Jewish neighbor in Beirut without knowing that that home was going to be in Palestine. My dad talked of his Jewish friends in Egypt, 
My mom reminded me that her school, the one her mother ran, was in the Jewish quarter of Beirut. I wondered how their experiences were different from mine. I considered the Israeli kids in the park with their nannies. Their parents and their grandparents might have been victims of the European Holocaust, but those same adults had probably never thought about anything about, had never thought anything about Arabs until they got to Israel. Yet here, now, not so much later, their children, me, me, these kids, none of us had ever known the other as anything but an enemy. It seemed so bizarre. I was suddenly struck by the reality of this conflict. It had not been going on for centuries. Its origins were recent, long ago and at the same time not that long ago. Each group of children has the memories of our parents' separate tragedies to defend and protect, and none of us really get it. The divisions and separations began to suddenly multiply spasmodically in my head and then collide and violently come together. Palestinian, Israeli, Arab Christian, Arab Muslim, Arab Jew, Palestinian American, Jewish American. My father stopped in his tracks on the way back to the car to tell me what he really thought about the Middle East conflict. Naz, you know, it's my generation that's messed it up. We are too connected to the events of 48 and 67. We were there, we participated, and until we're all gone, my generation, the Sharons and Arafats and all of us, nothing's going to get done. It's up to your generation to fix it, really. He put his arm around me as we resumed our walk. I turned my head to stare back at the saucer-eyed Palestinian children whose blank expressions mirrored my own. I began to photograph them obsessively wherever we went. I had no other way of capturing what I felt inside. On Tuesday, June 16, 1992, we piled into a UN vehicle and went to Gaza. My mom had told me I had to wear a skirt there, which I initially thought would be no big deal since I had brought many with me on the trip. As I got up from the breakfast room to change, my mother quickly and apologetically added that it could not be a very short skirt. I was taken back for a moment because my mother never seemed to care what we wore. But I heeded her warning and carefully chose a blue crepe Agnes B skirt that my parents had given me for my birthday. Long by my standards at the time, it hung just above my knees. I put on a pair of brown suede shoe Oxford shoes from Fratelli Rossetti, an elegant store on Madison Avenue. I had no idea what was expected. I had no idea what to expect. I thought I looked modest enough, especially since my real thin body and baby face make, made me look much younger than my 18 years. But as soon as we entered the van, the driver suggested he stop for me and my mother to get us some sort of full-length abayas, cloaks, and hijabs, or headscarves, on the way. My mother refused, chiding the driver in Arabic, we are not Muslim, but we are Arabs, and we can be respectful without being covered head to toe. He nodded his head and he let us be. I wanted to throw up. We entered the strip through a military checkpoint. There were army posts and intimidating soldiers manning stations all over the area and more barbed wire than I have ever seen. Daddy commented to us and later in his own article that the entrance gave the place the appearance of an enormous concentration camp. We were searched, cleared, and let through. I took pictures from the car window as we approached Gaza's Javelia refugee camp. There were people everywhere. This place has the highest population density in the world, Daddy told us. 65,000 people live here on top of each other. Naj, are you listening? In half a square mile of space. I was listening, but I didn't need to hear the details. I could see everything. The car windows were closed, but I could still smell the open sewers. Daddy continued to lecture us, all the while mentally taking notes for his article. The statistics are nightmarish. Terrible infant mortality rates, high unemployment, the lowest per capita income in the occupied territories, the most days of curfew, the fewest medical services, and on and on. And this was 20 years ago. Gaza today is much, much worse. Despite my mother's insistence that my outfit was fine, I felt very conspicuous and alienated from my people as I descended from the car. Then I put my fancy suede shoe down into the muddy earth of Gaza and inhaled that hor horrifying stench of raw sewage. It had penetrated the car window, but I had really only faint faintly smelled it when I was inside the vehicle. At that moment, I truly realized that I had absolutely no idea about anything. 
We had lunch the at the house of some important people. As we entered, all of the men, including my brother and father, were guided into one room, the women into another. I was confused. I had been to the Middle East many times before, and despite my rel relative isolation in recent years, had nevertheless grown up around lots of Arabs, Muslim and Christian alike, yet this was a custom that I had never, ever encountered anywhere but in the movies. I followed my mom into the female salon. The women began talking about cooking. I understood them, of course, but my Arabic was too weak for me to respond. Frankly, though, I really had nothing to say. I didn't cook. I didn't even eat. My mother nodded, smiled, and politely answered all their questions. I could tell she was slightly bored, but was making every effort not to show it. I, too, was bored, so I slipped away into the room with the men. A saucy, defiant act it was, but I knew I would get away with it. I knew that to these people I was both just a little girl and an essentially American one. I could always pretend I didn't know any better. My father saw me in the doorway and waved his hand, gesturing for me to come in. Quite a few of the men jumped up to give me their chairs, but I smiled sweetly and quietly and perched myself on the arm of my father's, where I ultimately drifted off into a daydream. They were, much to my chagrin, but not to my surprise, talking about what men in the Middle East always seem to be talking about, politics. I felt like I had played the part of the bored teenager in this scene in just about every country in the Arab world, so I knew what to do. Tune out. Arab men always, always seemed to want to sit and talk very seriously about politics. They would all listen intently to one another. Everyone would smoke a lot of cigarettes, drink, cu drink cups of Arabic coffee, and some would finger prayer beads as they thoughtfully considered the argument to which they were giving audience. In this smoke-filled room in Gaza, all eyes were fixed on my dad. Most of the men did not even know why my father was important, other than that he was a connection to the outside world, or more specifically to the West. The irony of my dad's renown is that until he passed away, his face and name were far more familiar to people outside Palestine than they were to anyone who actually lived there. They did know he was important, though, and that they had brought here, been brought here to tell him their stories. After we left, I asked Daddy to explain to me exactly what had been said. I wouldn't have been able to follow the heavily accented Arabic conversation even if I had been listening. Later in his article, he used virtually the same words he had used with me. I didn't hear a single hopeful thing in the two hours I was with the men. One of them spoke of having spent 17 years in jail, his children sick, of relatives destitute. There was a lot of anger. The phrase I kept hearing was mot batik, slow death. There seemed to be considerable animus against West Bankers, who were variously characterized by Gazans as spoiled or privileged or insensitive. We are forgotten, they all said and because of the unimaginably difficult job of dramatically or even slightly improving the general lot of Gazans, I was repeatedly enjoined at least not to forget. I can try to p conjure a picture of Gaza, but all I really remember of that day is a feeling. There was a dead goat, head and all, on a platter for lunch, and there was a small piece of fruit given to me by one of the young girls at the house, which I pretended to bite into and chew and swallow. She had plucked it off a tree near the porch for me, and then she chose a second piece for herself. She popped hers into her mouth and smiled. All that I noticed was the layer of filthy dust that covered the one she had given me. I didn't want to eat it because of the eight calories, but I also wondered how anyone could actually eat a piece of fruit without washing it. The inside of the house was immaculate and beautifully decorated, even though the outside was stinky and dirty. I tried to wrap my teenage brain head around the existence of such a place in the world where people are trapped like caged animals in the filthiest zoo on earth while I somehow got to prance around in suede shoes and $150 skirts and then get on a plane and go home. In this way, the trip to Palestine added another dimension to my anorexia. I wanted desperately to suffer, not just for my daddy, but for all of Palestine as well. I felt guilty, horrible, and sick to my stomach. I never wanted to eat again. How could I when others who were just like me in every other way were unlucky enough to be born into nothing. I then, so I'm going to stop there, but um, so that was the, the initial um, memory that triggered the writing of the play and the book. Um, and when I started working on both of these things, I was writing from a point of view of everyone says I'm my father's daughter, now my father's gone, and now I have to be my father's daughter. And I, I want to explain to you how little I know about where I'm from and who I am and what my father did.
But in the process of creating this work and the play as well, I realized that I am my father's daughter. Um, everything, everything in terms of the way I see the world and where I fit in it, everything I think about is colored by Palestine and being Palestinian um, and trying to find a way to integrate that part of my identity. And, and you know, my father talked of having various different identities and I, I have embraced all of my, um, my confusion, my awkwardness and my um, pain and difficulty at accepting being all of these different things. But at the same time, what's come through is that I'm still proud to be a Palestinian. <laughs> so when I travel to schools, which I do a lot with this work, I, um, I realize that what we have, in part thanks to my dad's work, but also in, thank in part, in th uh, in, but also thanks to like the work of so many people who work on behalf of, of Palestinian um, rights, justice, solidarity, is we have, you know, I went to college 20 years ago and you wouldn't be caught dead in a cafe unless you were actually Palestinian and wanted to start a fight or something. But now, I would say most of the kids on the college's campuses are well informed and they're aware, they're remark even the Jewish kids talk to me about, I mean, I went to one high school in New York and I think that they almost, they may have, after I left, started a program about talking about Jewish identity because a lot of the kids were raised by grandparents and parents who were deeply affected by the Holocaust, but these kids didn't agree with Israel's policies. And so th this one girl told me, my grandmother called me an anti-Semite, but I told her I'm a Jew, but I just don't like what Israel does, and what do I do? So there's a lot of that going on. And I think that what, what has, I've realized in the process of writing and working through this and actually engaging with younger people is that we've, whether it's just my father's work or all of our work or whatever it is, there is still a movement of, um, for justice and equality for Palestinians. And so this fear that everyone expresses that we wish he were alive to tell us what to do or to tell us how to react is, is totally understandable, but it's also not necessary because if I even turned out okay, <laughs> everyone else will too. And I have great, great faith in the coming generations of young people, whatever their identity, um, as you know, Americans and as immigrants to this country in terms of fighting for equality and justice for Palestine. So that's really all I wanted to read and talk about. Um, and I will take any questions that any of you have. Thank you so much. Let's uh, start right here. Just wait for a moment for the microphone so that we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Yusuf. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Saeed Derekat. I'm a Palestinian journalist, but I also teach a course on an Arab society, and I rely heavily on Orientalism and mm -hmm. shattered myths and so on. So not a day goes by without learning a new idea in the book. My question to you is quite simple. You said something that Palestine is a place and an idea. Mm -hmm. Could you please explain that? Because for us that have daughters that you know, were born and raised in this country, that is a perplexing thought. Yeah, I think that uh, it's interesting, and I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you. Um, this is one of the most common things that has come up in my own journey. Um, and one of the re another reason that I wanted to write this story was I wanted to talk about my father as a human being because I think there's a lot of, despite what he said about identity being fluid and having many different identities, many people have conflated my father with Palestine with a certain type of nationalism that I don't think was really what, um, he was about, which isn't to say he wasn't proud to be Palestinian and proud to fight for equality, but I think that um, for my dad, you know, and when he passed away, he had wanted to be buried in Lebanon, and certain people were upset about this. I don't know who these people are because I don't know them, but they were, they were out there um, because he was Palestine to so many people in Lebanon. What it seems like, you know, but my dad, like me, the only country I've ever really known in the Middle East is Lebanon. It's where my mom's family is from, and actually my dad's family, his mom has some roots in Lebanon as well. It's where my Palestinian family has lived, it's where my Lebanese family lived, and it's where we've been and where we felt was home. So 
part of the reason he wanted to be buried there was because it was quiet and <laughs> no one was going to disturb his rest. Um, but also, it was in many ways our home in the Arab world. And I think that that is something that I really wanted to stress. Because um, my father was born in Palestine in 1935, and he lived there until he was about 12, but he was also back and forth to Egypt. This is why some people say my dad lies and says, he, and says he's Palestinian, but he's really Egyptian. No, he's Palestinian, but he lived between Egypt and Jerusalem as a kid, and then he left. And he came to America, and he lived the rest of his life in America. He went back in 1992 for the first time. Uh, he may have been back one other time in the 60s. I'm not really sure. But um, he, it was not a place. And I am not one of the, uh, I have a lot of Palestinian friends, American Palestinian friends, who go home to Palestine. They're, they have family in Ramallah, or they have fa family in Israel proper, and their family are Israeli citizens in Haifa. Or I don't have that. I have no family there. I, my house is a, not mine, but it's, I don't know if it's still the International Christian Embassy, but there is a sign on it that said that Martin Buber lived there, which is really nice, because my dad also lived there. But anyway, um, so there's, I have no real connection to the actual place, and, and in many ways, my father did not either. So, and I'm not saying that to, to sort of s start a fight, but I think that what Palestine represented to him and what he, because my father was not really fond of nationalism and identities in any way. He liked being fluid. He liked being in exile. He liked being a million different things. Um, if you asked him his identity, he would say, I have many different identities. He would never, he would say he was Palestinian, but Palestinian, but he w would also say all the other things. Um, so for, for him and for me, Palestine, the idea of Palestine is just a simple, simple struggle for justice and human rights, and that's it. It just like any other struggle, South Africa, this country, wherever, it's about equality and justice, and that's all you need. You don't need any sort of, you don't need to be ashamed of that, when you, when you speak out on behalf of Palestinians, you don't have to be ashamed of where you're from or what you're saying because it's, it's very simple. And so um, I think that th that's been a way for me to sort of explain, especially when people are like, oh, your dad was an anti-Semite and all these things. Like, no, my father be believed in equality and justice. And I think that especially for those of us who are American, and feel maybe that we're mostly American and then have this other stuff behind us, Arab, Palestinian, Lebanese, Muslim, Christian, whatever it is, w what has been carried through to us by our family is that we're people and we have the same, we're entitled to the same rights as other people. And so that to me is why Palestine, despite it being not a place that I know very well or necessarily want to live, and my father used to say he didn't want to go back and live there, but he wanted it he wanted people to be treated equally. And that's as simple as it is. And I think that that's what I learned from him, is that it's not that complicated. I mean, yes, he wrote very intense, fancy academic books that were very hard to read. But the essential point is that people are all the same. <laughs> and, uh, it, and so I feel like my, my goal in, in, in with my work is just trying to continue that message, because it's really not that complicated. Thank you so much for the talk, uh, very informative. My name is Oscar Ordenes. Um, as a humanist in DC, I promote the intercultural uh, arts and humanities. Mm -hmm. And I have two questions, very brief. One is, are you considering doing your play, your monologue, Palestine, here in the future? Sure. Thank you. And second, in that play, how do you tackle the idea of the fact that any struggle begins with the liberation of women. <laughs> Thank you. Um, here's the other thing that happened. I wrote this play, and I was like, I don't really know what I'm talking about. I'm going to write a play about Palestine, even though I don't really know what I'm talking about, even though ah, I'm so insecure. And then I got an award for, from the feminist press for being like one of the top 40 feminists under 40. 
And I was like, wait, what? I did, I'm a feminist? Because I didn't even realize that a lot of my, the way I'd seen the Middle East was through the eyes of a young woman. And I think that that's part of, probably part of the reason that I wasn't interested, because I think that it seemed like men talked about politics and women weren't supposed, you know. And, but thankfully I had an amazing mother and grandmothers and family members who were quite, quite, incredibly well educated and strong and uh, had a lot of integrity and were just as vocal and and uh, and outspoken about things as my father um, but I I well to answer your question about my play <laughs> um, I would love to do it so if anyone has a theater or is a producer and wants to bring it to DC I think this would be an excellent environment to do it in. I don't have any specific plans but I would love to. Um, and that how I dealt with the, the female women issue is I didn't even deal with it. I just presented myself. I just stood on stage <laughs> and told the story. Um, and I think that a lot of it came out of that was this idea that, you know, this experience about which I wrote was when I was in Gaza in this, in this house where there were women in one room and men, in, that was the first and the only time I've ever experienced that in the Middle East. And I wanted to make that very, I want to make that very clear because the Arab women I grew up knowing and the, the women in the Middle East that I know in general are incredibly strong, intelligent, wonderful, powerful women. Um, and uh, so part of my own work is to, to dispel images that that the Middle East is this place where women are oppressed or treated like second class. I mean, there are certain laws and things in place that in all of the Arab countries that are patriarchal and unfair and all of that. But, you know, my grandmother, my mother's mother, ran a school in Lebanon. It was the first national um, secular school in Lebanon. And she came to America in the 30s to get a PhD. She was um, very active um, in Palestinian human rights. She was an Arab nationalist. She was brilliant. And that's my grandmother on my mother's side. That's not even my dad's family. Wadad Maktasi Kortas. She asked me to say her name, so I'm saying it. Um, so, uh, and all of my aunts, cousin, everyone, all the women I know are part of this as much as anyone else. And so part of the reason I also wanted to write the book was because as an actress, there's a, a really limited um, idea of what an Arab woman is, and I talk about this a lot. And you know, especially Hollywood, it's this idea that you go to, a, you get the job you're going to get in a movie is a girl wearing a scarf on her head, uh, who's either like the sister, the cousin, the wife, somebody of the terrorist guy, and it angers me so much because it's. It's so one-dimensional, and that's really what initiated my my um, my interest in approaching this subject matter or my identity is that I it's I mean maybe this is how my parents raised me, but I think it's just a human reaction to this idea that I've grown been born and raised in New York City, and I'm for all intents and purposes American, <laughs> and then I go to these auditions, and they're like, okay, you have this name, so you're gonna be an Arab woman, and this is what an Arab woman is. And I, I will not stand for that. So I'm not entirely sure if I answered your question, but that's, to be fair, the, my, my status as a woman is probably what initiated most of this e exploration of identity. And I'm just gonna continue to talk and talk and talk and be annoying um, and just make clear that uh, I come from a culture where women are far more um, powerful and interesting than others may know. My name is George Hishmi. I wonder whether you have uh, suggestions or ideas how as a parent or grandparent will tell your offsprings about Palestine. When do you start? How do you do it? Things like that. Since you, you had a gap in your upbringing. Well, I think that it's very interesting. Uh, that, that's a great question. And 
What I've noticed when my family members who have read the book have said that they felt sad because they didn't realize what pain I was in. As I mean, there's a lot more in the book than what I read, obviously, but they didn't realize what pain I was in over my identity. And a lot of, a lot of what I went through was racial difficulties. I mean, I was, I had, like in the world I grew up at the time, New York, I was on, you know, as I said, on the east side with the blonde girls, and I had brown hair, and I lived on the side where the Jewish people lived. So I was like, basically had this idea in my head. It was all in my head. It wasn't, but what I saw in front of me was that I am different. I'm Jew, like I'm, but I wasn't really a minority because there was no sort of Arab American identity at the time. And then I would go home, and my parents were like, "You're Arab. You're Arab." You're <laughs> so. To their credit, they were trying to make me proud, but I think in a lot of ways I got very confused. I tell the story in the book, sorry, Mommy, <laughs> um, about how when I, you know, I started kindergarten in 1979, and then when I was in the first grade, um, the hostages, the Iranian hostages were released, and we had, like, they wheeled the TV into the school, into our classroom, and we got to see this thing on TV, and... I went home and I was deliriously happy because the Americans were free. <laughs> and my mom told me that I should be happy, of course, because that's great, but that the Algerians who were Arabs helped broker this agreement to free these people from the Iranians. So I got really mad at her. I was six years old, so that was a little bit complicated. I mean, now I think it's awesome, but it confused me a lot because I just wanted to fit in. And when you're a little, when you're six, you know good guys, you know you know good guys and bad guys. So I, we were American and we weren't Iranian. And so part of the problem is that's how we set things up in this country. I'm, I'm sure most, I don't know, I've never been raised in another country. But y you were either taught to be American or something else. And if you're not American, if you don't agree with America, I think it's different now. I think that, and, and someone quoted the other day, my father used to say, um, dissent is the greatest form of patriotism, um, meaning that like part of being an American, especially like considering what's going on now today in this very city, is voicing your discontent with, um, with you know, standing for all things that America stands for um, publicly and on a global scale. So. I think that it's important to, to let kids know where they're from and to have them be proud of it. Um, and I do very much commend the way that my parents constantly, constantly plied me with images of Arabs that were, um, or, or like introduced me to a culture that I was just part of and, and, and that, you know, I, I came to love the Middle East because it was where my home was and where there was food and love and people. And I think that that's the best way. If you just um, show yourself as a human being who's, you know, a grand, their grandfather, their father, their mother, it's good to know where you're from. People want to know where they're from, especially in this country. And one of the things I remember in high school, I, somebody asked me where my dad was from, and this is the first time I'd ever said it. I said, he's from Palestine. And I said, and the guy, the guy said, <laughs> wait, where's that? And I said, it's called Israel now. And he goes, they just changed it? <laughs> it's not that hard, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, kind of, yeah, and they had to leave. And that's all I said. And he was like, that's not fair. So um, I think that there are very simple ways to talk about it. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't discourage what my, I think what my mom did is great because it obviously did help me. But, you know, it's, it's important to, to, to talk to them about it, but let them sort of, I think, let them lead and let them ask questions um, because that's what I ultimately ended up doing because I just didn't understand. Um, and it's a different world now, you know, like when I grew up, it was uh, very different. And, you know, I had to come of it, you know, like I said, my, I was born in 1974 and the Civil War was like, in Lebanon was basically from the, when I was about one year old until I was like 16. And then uh, after that, as soon as that ended, there was, well, during that, there was the Intifada, the first Intifada in Palestine. Then there was the Gulf, the first Gulf War. <laughs> then I went to college during the Oslo years, and I kind of took a break from being tortured by my culture. 
And <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And then I, I graduated and then 9-11 and now post 9-11. So I've never had a break from from having to confront these things. But I, I think what I learned to do in a very different way from my brother who really set out to learn the language and learn the culture and live in it. And this is possibly because I was female. I just listened and asked questions. And I think my parents did a really good job of, of helping me along the way um, until I was ready to start speaking for myself. And, and, and so I, I would say, you know, I, I would possibly be a little, I would say to a parent, um, and I don't know what I know about parenting, but just to be aware of, if you have a sensitive kid in any way, like I'm, I'm a sensitive, I was a sensitive kid, I'm a sensitive grown up, it's why I'm an artist, it's why I'm a writer, it's why I'm an actress, um, that if they seem to feel different or left out, that you might want to explore that with them, because it could have more, because um, there's a lot of, and it's, as I said, it's a different world now, it's a much more multicultural wor world, but we, do live in a society where people make comments all the time about Arabs, about Palestinians, about Muslims, without any regard for the fact that they're, it's racism and it's hurting. So if a kid is sensitive and internalizes that, it's good to be aware of that. Because I really, really did. I just, I thought I was like a dirty, disgusting person. And apparently my family didn't know because I didn't say it out loud. So um, I think that that's important because there's a racial element too. Um, and, and I think that even though we live in this like very, as I said, multicultural world, I think that especially now there's a lot of polarization in our society and a lot of identity, um, extremes and, and it's, it's very important to be aware of, of what your kids are, um, internalizing and picking up, um, because I, I mean, I still sometimes watch movies and I'm like, the bad guy is an Arab guy, of course, but he's a bad guy. He should be the, you know, I don't know. I still think in these terms because I was raised with it. Yes. Right. To say Jesus, I says yes, love them. Yes, right, yes, Jesus. My grandmother was from Nazareth, and I, I remember I once asked her if she knew Jesus when she was little, and she got very <laughs> mad at me. <laughs> she was old, so I thought, I don't know. But that was a, that's a great way in for a lot of young people, because I think that, you know, and, and especially if you're Christian. I mean, you don't have to be Christian, but if you are Christian, people are always amazed. How did you get to be Christian? I'm from Nazareth. <laughs> I don't understand, though. How did you get to be Christian? And so this is part of it as well. Is, and also making those connections for people. I was talking with a young Egyptian woman yesterday, and we were saying how when I was in school, I learned about Egypt, ancient Egypt, and how amazing it was. But then I didn't know that Egypt now was like the same country. Because like ancient Egypt was amazing, but modern Egypt was some Arab place and it's you know these are the things that we have to we have to make connections you know it's like we have to connect that we are it's the same place and it's got a long history and we can be proud of ancient Egypt we can also be proud of modern Egypt I mean well I don't know Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Larry Shinagawa. I'm with the New World Research Institute. Uh, the question I have is this. In my case, I have a Japanese American and an Asian American and an Asian identity as well as being an American. Mm -hmm. And they are multiple identities, but they overlap quite a lot. But I'm very significantly aware of race, just like you are. Yes. And what I wanted you to do is maybe perhaps comment about how you have these multiple identities and how they intersect with one another and how they're somewhat different and yet they're empowering for you. Sure. Hi, my name is David Hilditch. Um, talking of polarization, um, I'm, I'm also wondering if there's any hope for reconciliation between uh, 
the ga between Gaza and the West Bank. Um, yes, it, they just seem to be drifting further and further apart. And people talk about two, the two-state solution, the one-state solution, is there a three-state solution or, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> and secondly, very quickly, you also talked about women. Whatever happened to Hanan Hashrawi, who years ago was always on the news and uh, seemed to be the, uh, the relatively sane face of Palestinian nationalism. She seems to have disappeared. I know she's around a little bit, but we just don't see she's her anymore. She's on TV sometimes. Okay. <laughs> um, so to address the first question, thank you. Um, I, I talk about this a lot in the book, and I, I have a conversation with my father about this in the book, because when I was about 18 was when this like whole political correct movement began, and people would say, I'm African-American, or I'm whatever American. And uh, everyone thought that my father was a huge fan of that because he was always talking about, you know, being Palestinian and being Arab and all these things. And and he was to a degree, but he said, you you know, you have to be careful because when you're separating yourself out, you're separating yourself out. And so he talks to me a bit about how in Canada you're, you're almost like, because America is based on this idea of assimilation, that the, the overriding thing comes that you have to find a way to be American and like, you can be African American or Asian American or whatever it is, but you have to make sure that American is the one in capital letters somehow, and that how that's really just almost impossible for many of us. Um, and so, in the book, I struggle a lot with. I feel Arab and I feel American, but I don't feel you know. When I'm in Lebanon, I feel completely American. When I'm here, I feel completely Ar Arab sometimes. And then, of course, when Gaza is being attacked, I feel, and I'm here, I feel more just isolated and sad and scared and alone than ever but yet I still don't completely I mean if I, sometimes I go to a protest this has happened to me before in 2008 when the Gaza was being attacked and I went to a protest and then the other protesters were shouting Allahu Akbar and I was like well I'm not Muslim I can't what does that have to do with Palestine and then I felt like I didn't belong there and so I'm not I don't identify with my religion but I just felt like we constantly are doing these things where we're making people feel left out. When again, this the story, the this what we're trying to do is is assert that we're all the same. Um, so I just, I've just I think accepted that I'm not Arab or American or Arab American or I don't know. I'm just what I'm all of those things and none of them at the same time. Or I'll say I'm from New York. Because that's my most my most clear identity that I have, and that just means I'm weird anyway. So, um, and that's why I write about being I, like the first line I say: I grew up as a Jew in New York City. Because there are these cultural identifications that, like, if you live in this neighborhood and you act this way, you're this thing. So they're all completely arbitrary, and um, and uh, I think that that's. But I, I don't think it's ever going to go away. But I think that it, I think that I now realize it's what fueled my father's work and in a way it fuels my work I don't talk about it as eloquently I don't talk about like exile and the poetry of not feeling rooted I just be talk about being confused and feeling uncomfortable but um, it's the same thing and what it what it what it does is it encourages you to constantly seek connections and alliances with other people so to bridge into the other question um, you know I I think that you know my father was one of the first people to speak of the one state solution and when people ask me about this I'm like I'm not a politician or a diplomat or anything I don't know how these things happen I know it takes a lot of time but it is so clear and I don't know why it has taken this long for people to understand this that the only fair solution <laughs> is to have a country where everyone has the same rights it's pretty simple once again so um, in terms of what you're saying, um, when people say that to me in terms of Gaza and the West Bank, I mean, the first thing that has to happen is there has to not be a wall and an, a military occupation, and people in Gaza need to be able to leave and come and go. And, um, you know, the very way it's set up now with the Palestinians are not, cannot be a united group of people because there's West Bank Palestinians, there's Palestinians who live within the state of Israel and have citizenship. There are Pas Palestinians in Gaza, and then there are diaspora Palestinians. And among diaspora Palestinians, there's like m my father who was born there and me who was born here. Uh, I don't know how how we're going to um, get out of 
the actual physical political situation, but I do know that the only way is to start working toward taking down all of the walls and barriers and letting the country be an open country for all the people who live there. Um, and I don't know what happened to Hanan Ashrawi. I've seen her on TV a bunch. I met her on that trip, but that was 20 years ago. So We are just about out of time, but we'll just have one last question right up here in, in front, and then we'll invite you to join us uh, to check out Najla's book and get some copies as well. First of all, I want to, I'm so proud. Thank you. Uh, your journey of discovery of your identity is so inspiring while you were talking and unraveling the problems that you were facing in order to define a clear sense of identity. Your mother told you you're an Arab-American. Your father was an Arab-American. But wh why the emphasis on Palestine? Because Palestine encapsulates the indignity that a, trans that a bargain has taken place yes. where the conscience of the West has allowed a bargain to absolve the West from the crisis that it has done during the 30s and 40s, mm -hmm. and therefore they have become permissive to Israel violating the human and national rights right. of the Palestinians. Yes. So you are a Palestinian Arab and an American Palestinian Arab identity. So it's not a composition your Arab identity subsumes the Palestinian land, but the Palestinian has to be emphasized because it is the epitome of the humiliation yes. that we want to recover from. Yes. Thank you. I also recommend, even though I'm here to promote my own book, um, Amin Malouf has a book called, I don't know what it's called in French or Arabic, but it's... Um, it's called identity, <laughs> uh, violence, and the need to belong, or something like that. And it's, uh, and he says in it that, um, you know, we tend to stick to the. And he's obviously Lebanese and has a lot of different conflicts of his own identity. But he speaks of this that you're always going to defend the one that needs to be the most defended. So, um, you know, my sister-in-law is half Irish and half Palestinian, and she always says she's Palestinian first and it's not because she's not proud to be Irish but she's like well we're okay Ireland's okay right now so I'm gonna speak out about being Palestinian and she's right you know like you do want to defend the one that is the most you know that needs to be defended and and that's okay to hang on to that identity there is a part of holding on to that identity because you're trying to insist that you exist and you're alive and that's part of who you are and you're not gonna pretend it's not there because you owe it to your family and your ancestors and all the other people to say this is part of who I am um, in the same way that people in this country who are Native American like to say that they're Native American it's, it's very it happens all the time and it shouldn't be any different for Palestinians thank you Nezra, thank you very much please join us and come check out the book <laughs>